tonight, we are talking about the David Byrne uh, concert film, uh, David Byrne's American Utopia, directed by Spike Lee. And we have two incredibly great guests to talk to this about, both of whom uh, wrote for the Dallas Morning News for a substantial amount of time. Still do. Still do. Yes. Well, <laughs> our, we're staffers at the paper. Now you are freelancers, so you there make you the big freelance money. And an important distinction, yes. Yes, a very important distinction. It means you don't have to go into the office as much. Um, but uh, Manny, aside from writing about dance, also for many years was a television critic. Um, and uh, during the heyday of reality television and watched more real reality television than anybody I know. Manny is also notable for the person who turned me on to The Sopranos before it was actually aired. I distinctly remember one night we were over at his place and he said, I just got these DVDs. You're all going to love this show. And uh, boy, that, that, would be, that would be VHS. <laughs> oh, VHS. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. It was a long time ago. Do you know how I got those? Uh, from the TV conference thingy. No, Bark, Uncle Barky was on vacation and I went into his office and said, <laughs> that is a true story. We are, we are recording this, I want you to know. That's fine. And uh, Thor, Christian, Thor has been writing about music for uh, pretty much as long as I've been in Dallas. And uh, we're really happy to have both of them to talk about this show, which I assume all of you have seen. I was very excited um, to see this and heard, when I heard it was gonna be out on HBO Max, I was really excited. Uh, a good friend of mine from New York uh, went to see it twice. He was so excited about it. Um, and indeed, I, I really um, enjoyed it. Uh, before, before we get to, uh, I'm going to go to Thor first and, and Manny second. And, and the reason I wanted Thor and Manny is I wanted Thor to talk about the music. And one of the things that is sort of special about this is there is definitely a performative element. And, and if you look at David Byrne's you know, trajectory from the early music videos through Stop Making Sense, through, um, through um, doing the music for uh, Twyla Tharp's Catherine Wheel, where I think he sort of picked up some tricks about performance, and Manny, maybe you can talk about that. Um, to, um, I don't know if any of you know about this film that he did a couple of years ago called Contemporary Color, which was about like March drill teams. Mm -hmm. And like all of this kind of comes together in this film. So Thor, you want to talk about the musical journey and what makes this film interesting from your perspective? Sure. I was I was lucky enough to see uh, this tour, the uh, American Utopia tour, twice before he turned it into a film. Um, some of you may have seen it. It, it played at the Windspear Opera House in April uh, of 2018, and I missed that show, but I saw it at the New Orleans Jazz Festival, which was a bizarre place because it was a daytime festival with 50,000 people standing in a field dancing. So it's kind of the opposite of what we watched on HBO. Um, it was just, you know, a bunch of drunken people all having a great time. And, but you couldn't necessarily see David Byrne um, in this huge, vast field. Then I was lucky enough to see him, I think in October of 2018, the same tour played at Verizon Theater in uh, Grand Prairie, and that just totally blew me away. I mean, I, I've been a huge uh, David Burden fan for years, and I've seen him probably half dozen times. And, and to me, he, the thing that worked so well about American Utopia, uh, the film, is the fact that he decided to basically be a minimalist. I think at one point he talks about how he wants to eliminate everything and just pare it down to the basic, you know, necessities. And you don't need a drum kit. All you need is musicians and a stage. And, and he pulled it off, I thought, in a way that very other few, you know, few people can do as well as, as him. And the, and, the, and the thing that really struck me is that if you compare American Utopia to the most successful concert documentary of the last couple of years, which is Beyonce's Homecoming, they're polar opposites. I mean, as, as good as Beyonce was, that was all about bombast. It was, 
you know, look at how great a great of dancer I am. And it was just, it was just so busy and so over the top. Whereas what I loved about American Utopia is he just paired it back to the essentials. And that's, I think what makes David Byrne great and going all the way back to stop making sense. Um, one of the things Thor, um, got a little guest appearance from CC Rocket here. Um, so, um, in, in, in this film, we see um, many songs that he has played over the years and some of them for a long time ago. Can you talk about how these songs have changed over their years and the way in which their, their performances are different? Well, to, to me, he, you know, he's one of these guys who never does the same song twice and this comes across well in American Utopia. Uh, I mean, you're, they're all pretty recognizable. He doesn't do a, you know, a Cajun uh, polka version of Burning Down the House. He does Burning Down the House, it, but it's, uh, he puts his own spin on it. But to me, just what made it so great, and, I, and I'm dying to hear Manny's uh, thoughts on this, is just all the choreography. Uh, again, he, you know, we've all been to rock concerts. We all know that the lead singer stands here and the drummer's back here and the bass player's over here. And sometimes they interact, but mostly they don't. Well, you know, David Byrne totally threw that script out the door mm -hmm. and invented something new. And that's, you know, musically, I thought it worked well, but I think it, it worked best at, um, visually. And that's something that a lot of, a lot of musicians and rock bands just forget to do. Yeah. Uh, so Manny, do you want to talk about the performance as a music performance and as the performance as dance? Well, I mean, I think that really the, uh, the, the dance stuff um, is done very well. And I think uh, one of the things that makes this different, um, which Thor has alluded to, is, is the elimination of, and Byrne talks about it, uh, getting rid of everything. Um, and he actually, I mean, he has a reason for this. It's not just a, you know, a visual choice. He, he, think, he says at one point in the show that of all the things that people like to look at, the thing they like to look at the most is other people. And this is the reason uh, he gives for trying to have no wires. You know, people are carrying their instruments. I mean, there's definitely a, a kind of marching band uh, drill team feel to it and um, yeah there's a certain freedom in the even though they're in a box and they don't hide the fact that they're in a box they really give people the freedom to sort of float around um, as much as uh, the, as much as they want or as much as the choreographer whose name is Annie B. Parson uh, decided they should um, and a lot of it is, you know, in that kind of postmodern vein of a lot of gestural stuff. I mean, we all know the famous, you know, David Byrne, yes. which he which he quotes visually um, at one point. Uh, so I think it, and I and the other thing is that I think, you know, Spike Lee uh, does some interesting things with the overhead shots um, and kind of the way uh, he moves he moves the camera around. Um, I also think maybe you can answer this part there's so they're wearing these gray suits and the lighting really tends toward blue and i feel like i've seen so many movies in the last few years where like blue gray is the palette that seems to be like the palette of film of the moment well you know it, 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 these things come in in you know in waves you know there's at one point there was a desaturation look that everybody went with and um you know the thing is that with I'm just talking on top of my head here, is that blue light requires a kind of subtlety that the and these new sensors can read a whole lot. So you, you can kind of do a little bit more with that as as um, but yeah, I think that, that that sort of white costumes and the is very kind of important. And I think the lighting was really kind of great. Manny, Manny, have you seen Stop Making Sense in a while? It'd be interesting to think about comparing yeah how uh, that was directed and how how this was directed yeah i mean i think it's very different i have not seen stop making sense in a while but i feel like the camera moved a lot side by side there was a lot more cutting 
it was um, because again, I think Byrne was kind of moving around a lot, a lot, not necessarily in a choreographed way. And so the camera was, did a lot of this, uh, as I recall, and stop making sense. This seems like a really, you know, that seems from like another time, really. Um, yeah. I, I watched it last night. And, and the first thing that struck me is like after watching this and then seeing him, it's like how young he looked with black hair. And it was just like, he had this energy that was like, I had completely sort of forgotten about. Um, and, but there were also some kind of similarities that I sort of wasn't expecting that I, that, you know, there's um, when he sings home, I think it's home in um, Stop Making Sense, he has this lamp that he's doing this sort of choreography with. Do you remember that scene? And, mm -hmm. and, and then in, in, in this film, um, there's a thing with the, with the stage light that is somewhat similar and the light is used in a similar sort of way. Um, the end. Yeah. Um, and, and I had also forgotten how much like choreography there was in that, um, like all these kind of gestures that he would do. Um, and that's, you know, aside from the, this thing, which is like the thing we mostly remember, there's an awful lot of other things with, you know, some of the other songs that he would do that he would movements that, that, um, you know, that I think that he understood early on that a lot of other uh, musicians don't do on stage, that, that this, this sense of how you use your body is kind of unique. And it's not for some sexual thing, but it's just a way of being performative in a different kind of way. It's not dance, it's not normal rock and roll performance. It's something that's kind of unique. Yeah, maybe it's more like, um... It, it, he, he, there's not, I mean, there's no moment, maybe it's just with David Byrne 24 hours a day, there's like no moment when there isn't a self-consciousness about David Byrne. I mean, there's always a meta thing with Byrne is that Byrne is always being like Byrne and there's something very, you know, Byrne-ish about him. And he ver he doesn't, there's never a moment where you, where you think, well, he's not really, he's just let himself go and he's not thinking about anything. And I actually thought to me, I know there's been a lot of talk about the visuals and you know this is called cinematic conversations for me watching this film earlier today um what struck me most were the themes of burns music and how much they carried through and um a lot of the at least four or five of the songs directly speak to the idea of home and of belonging you know you've got um, um everybody's worry. coming to my house yeah uh, and, you know, there's some anxiety about that. Uh, there, yeah. Don't worry about the government. He's talking about, um, I'm picking a building to live in. It's got all the conveniences. Um, and then know, watching, watching TV. There's a lot of watching TV. <laughs> yeah. Once in a lifetime, this idea of, you know, is this really my home? You know, is this my beautiful car? Is this my beautiful wife? Um, and I, I just feel like that whole sense of home and belonging is something that's kind of burned has been exploring his whole career and really watching this film, I hadn't really thought of him that way before until I, so I thought the film was very useful um, in that way. The other thing too, is that I think this is not a completely unknown thing, but the idea of how the Talking Heads pivoted um, in the early eighties into incorporating all of these African polyrhythms in their music. A lot of that is also there from very early on um, in, some of the um early Zimbabwe. what's that a song called i zimbabwe is an early uh, one well it's actually it's in it's in the film it's e, e zimbra e Zimb yeah excuse me i'm sorry it's, yes it's, it's, I, actually, I don't know if you know i don't even know if it would play through zoom but i've, I've got it actually queued up but <laughs> and that whole idea of dada and uh he talked about that the lyrics to e zimbra are a nonsense yeah. uh hugo ball uh, yeah right poem. Um, and that's really that album, which precedes the album when they went very, you know, African polyrhythm is the third Talking Heads record, which is called Fear of Music. And that's right. these embers on that record. And for me, that is, if you're going to say there's a pivot, that's the pivot is that song um, where there's this idea of, of Dada, but there's also this idea of, you know, pure rhythm uh, almost uh, taking over from uh, the sense of melody that we most often associate with, you know, pop songs. Um, and um, 
so I, so I was, I, yeah, I was, I really um, was interested in like kind of his ideas. I thought, you know, he started out with the um, holding that brain. brain and he talks about how when we're born, we've got all of this capacity that actually gets reduced mm -hmm. as time goes on, not necessarily in a bad way, but maybe we find what's useful and we throw away the rest. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, he's like a lot of artists. He's very interested in this idea about what makes us human and what makes how we relate to other people. Uh, and I thought the film does a really good job of kind of exploring those ideas. Yeah, and I think getting back to that sense of roots, I think there are two other elements. Um, there, there's the Brian Eno influence of, of, of mixing all of that other kind of music, which sort of got him to think about music sort of differently. And then there was that, um, what was the name? Rio Momo album that he did where he had a band of, of, of Latin American musicians behind him, um, which also, I mean, so he really did in those years kind of get that sense of, of, of world music into pop music. And then here we have, you know, the, the, there are more percussionists than anything else in there. You know, the, the melody in many of the times is, is subservient to the voice and the movement. Um, and, uh, and I think that makes for something uh, different. Thor, what are, what are your thoughts on all this? Well, I, um, I agree. You mentioned earlier the aerial shots. And to me, that was one of the most spectacular things about American Utopia, the film, is that Spike Lee, I don't know, I don't think he was up there himself with the camera, but somebody was up there uh, filming them, and you could see how choreographed it was. Uh, uh, Manny, I think at one point you said that you did, you got the feeling that it wasn't choreographed, but you could tell from, uh, from the aerial shots that every step pretty much was uh, meant to, to go a certain way. And some of those aerial shots were just spectacular. Like when they were shaped, I think like an X, uh, when they were doing burning down the house, maybe, um, that was a pretty amazing scene. And there was another shot when they were just walking, uh, along in this little box shaped stage, uh, that was pretty amazing too. So even though David Byrne, I don't know how old he is now, I'm, I'm guessing he's in his late sixties. He's, He's not the remarkable dancer he was in Stop Making Sense in 1984, where he was doing the, the weird drunken chicken dance and all these bizarre, and he had the big boxy suit, and he was he was just so much, he was just a remarkable, you know, quirky, avant-garde dancer, yeah. um, and at the same time, not a dancer back then. Today, fast forward 30 years later, He's kind of a more sedate frontman, but you know he lets the choreography do the work. He lets the fact that his band they all know how to move around, and to me that was you know breathtaking in this film. Yeah, two of the people uh, in the cast are there mostly, you know, to to dance. I guess what I feel like so that movement that you see, I mean, some of that is, I mean, again, there's a fine line between choreography and blocking, and a lot of that is just simply you know, it's just blocking. It's like you move from here to there. I don't necessarily always think of that as core. I think there's some really interesting choreography in it. But again, I think on a music concert, you, you can only do that. You know, it's not, it's not a dance performance. And so you're using that, um, but it's subservient to, to me, the other things that are going on. But it's definitely crucial in the visual look of the film, the way that they, they are, everything has been blocked, you know, to the nth degree. So Manny, what are those those dance moments that you thought were the were the the best of of the performance of the dance? Well, really, any time the the uh, the two dedicated dancers um, were on camera, um, they were they're fantastic. And that guy Chris DiGiarmo, or how do you say his name? He's apparently done some other things, including with Burn. Um, I thought that was most. I'm, I really felt like the what the what what the effect was, especially in the first half of the film, is that it it really did accomplish Burns' goal that he states about totally eliminating the separation between the audience uh, and the performers on stage, which is you know kind of why you eliminate wires and instruments that are planted on the ground. It also made me realize that 
I'd enjoy it 10 times more in person that, you know, in watching it as a film, it just cannot, that kind of thing, I don't think can, you know, come any, no matter how good it is, it's not like being in the room. Uh, and of course, we're in a time when it's much more difficult um, to be in the room seeing um, live performance. Um, so I think it's sort of an ironic thing about the, the power of this film, as great as it is, I kept thinking, God, what would it have been like if I'd actually been, been there? And it, it, uh, it was interesting to see, I don't know what the name of the theater was in, in New York where he did it, but it was a very tiny little uh, theater. And you know, when I saw him at Jazz Fest, like I said, it was 50,000 people in a field. Mm -hmm. And then when I saw him at the Verizon Theater on the same tour, uh, it was maybe 2,000 people. And it was pretty much what you saw in the film, whereas for half of the show, people are just kind of sitting and watching. And then when a big hit comes along, like burning down the house or one of the talking head students, people get up and they start dancing around and the, and the audience is really getting into it. So it reminded me, it made me sort of nostalgic for concerts uh, like that, which I haven't been to in a while, like the rest of, of, of you guys. Um, but there are like there, there are moments when the cinema is really kind of particularly like the overhead shots and some of the shots where the lighting is particularly dramatic. Um, and sometimes when you get into close ups um, of like the, the the legs and the dance of the performance. And there's some moments that I think where where having a, a, a nice good sound system and a large television um, create a very good experience of, of this. But I'm obviously biased. <laughs> yes, you don't, yeah. you don't need to sp spend ninety dollars and go to a theater to, to yeah. see. Yeah, or one hundred and twenty-five. <laughs> so I told Bart ahead of time. I got. I had the great privilege of seeing um, this live in Boston, where it previewed before going to Broadway. So you know, it was. I think it was only there for about three weeks, and they were switching things up a lot. And he did a Q and A with the audience. It was pretty spectacular. And um, so, I, so I will say, as, as, as wonderful as that live um, theater was, the film does, like Bart says, you have the aerial, you have the, the drone shot um, high up that shows them, you know, them sort of mimicking a marching band and then all the close-ups and the multiple takes. So it actually, you know, it was charming to see what Spike Lee did the end with the bicycles with them going out yeah. on the bicycles and then going back into theater was precious because I got the sense that um, David Byrne didn't really want to do that. Um, he's an advocate for cycling in New York City. He has designed uh, bicycle racks. He's been for, for 30 years, he has been advocated, um, you know, less cars and more bicycles. So he really does cycle like that. But I, I think he was like, went along with that, um, you know, a little bit reluctantly, but I thought it was very charming. And uh, so- they use uh, the school school school. Good. I don't know if you want to talk about- The high school choir at the end. Good. Right, they use the high school choir at the end for um, My House. Yes. That yes. he mentions earlier in the show. Yeah. Yeah, you know, not to mention all of the, um, black and brown people who've been killed by police at the end with the mothers holding their photos. That's all Spike Lee. And that was very, very beautiful. Um, and because what, what was in the original production was um, David Byrne got Janelle Monet's permission to use, to use um, her, her song that says, say his name, say his name. He got permission to use that. Um, and then Spike took that one you know, one further place. So I thought that was really powerful too. And and to me, that was the one like moment that is definitely Spike Lee. It's like, like the rest of this could have been done by almost anybody. There was nothing that is definable as a Spike Lee moment, but the way he used the people holding the pictures definitely had his signature look to it, I think. Yeah. And I think it fit in uh, because I think there's a, there's really a political or at least humanistic dimension uh, to the film throughout. Byrne, you know, again, seems to always be advocating for diversity and for read. And it, it shows just in, you know, who is in the cast. Um, I mean, it's some people talk about diversity, but this is absolute in every kind of way in which he's, you know, bringing these people, bringing both the musical styles and the performers 
um, to do that, which I thought was really great. But what's really odd is that you have all these sort of native instruments being held by like a marching band style drum to them. So it was, there was a kind of interesting visual disconnect to that for, for me. The other, yeah, um, I think that was, he yeah, talked yeah. about, isn't there one point in, there's one point in the film where he says, well, people think they keep on, at, they're, they're asking me, there's gotta be tapes. You know, you, you must be doing this to tapes. Somebody and, in San Antonio said that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, he pointed out, he figured out a way to make it sound great. You don't, and you don't need, you know, uh, you don't need to be connected. He, he was sort of bragging about how, forgot, I think he called it untethered. And that's, yeah. that's what was so great about this film. As much as I love Stop Making Sense, it was still, a rock band with, uh, you know, plugged in guitars and a drum kit, or where this is something totally different. And uh, it's interesting because he, you know, David Byrne here in this movie tried to do something new with the rock concert. And it's, you know, people have pretty much given up on it. And when they do try something new, sometimes they fall flat on their face. And the, the show that comes to mind was, I think three years ago, Kanye West, on his, I think it was his St. Pablo tour. Uh, I saw him at American Airlines Center. He tried to reinvent the rock concert with a floating stage that floated 20, 20 feet above the American Airlines Center floor and moved all around, but you couldn't see him. <laughs> so it, it was a great, it was a great concept to have a floating stage, but uh, no, the people below him couldn't could not see Kanye West and the people above, it was so dimly lit. So a long way of, of saying that David Byrne, you know, set out to reinvent the concert and he pulled it off, I thought, in this film. Yeah, maybe uh, it was design error that they designed this thing and just got the wrong thing. Reference to film. Okay, never mind. I wonder, was the, was the set that we saw with those kind of metal, B curtains was that the same set that was on the road? It was. I had, uh, when I saw when I saw him at um, Verizon Theater in Grand Prairie, uh, they had that same set. They did not have that set at uh, when I saw this tour at New Orleans Jazz Fest because. Ты очень красивая девочка. Ты красавица. Ты моя солнце. I'm sorry. Go on. I, I'm sorry. I didn't hear that. I didn't either. Either. It was hard to read. Could you type that in the in in the chat? Well, the uh, you were talking Bart. You were talking about the uh, the the strings in the background, and to me, they look like sort of metallic beads. Yeah. Uh, but the, the the reason it works so well in concert is it just made this sort of shimmering silver box of the stage, so you really felt like they were performing in like this bizarre shoebox artwork um so that was really cool and yeah and it, did, it did it did very much read as an installation and they're very 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 tall too it goes up i don't know how many feet in a very 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 high high theater so in that sense it's quite it's quite magical they did remind me of new orleans beads as you're talking about new orleans like the, they mm -hmm. they do feel like you know there's a weight to them and they're one yeah. color but that they move them and can hide behind the the screen and um, one of my i was struck my by favorite the, the, Go on. I was going to say one of my favorite points in, in the film is when the band members go outside of the beads, but they stick their instruments inside. Yeah. So all you see yeah. is their hands and playing the guitar, but their bodies are behind the beads. So that was just, I'm, yeah. I'm guessing that was David Burns. You know, what, what, yes. Yeah. One, one funny thing that I remember uh, someone in the, one of the Q and A's asked about the bare feet. And they were like very nervous. Some even the audience, it does look a little dangerous to have, you know, some of these very petite, some of the women on stage are, are quite tiny actually. Um, and with with their feet, bare feet, with the he wanted to downplay the uniforms. He because the rigidity of them all wearing suits, he wanted he didn't he didn't want to put, you know, Oxfords on everyone's feet. So that's why the bare one of the reasons the bare feet to kind of um, make it less corporate. Um, even though he's he's sort of referencing corporate the corporate world with the with the suits, um, but that that the bare feet they felt more vulnerable on stage, moving around and you know possibly injuring each other. Yeah, um, 
I thought it was probably a little cold there. You need to be warm. <laughs> no. Um, so well, Matt, you know, on the tune Toe Jam. What about Toe right, Jam? On, when they were playing Toe Jam, yeah. there were all those close ups of the feet. Yes. Moving and dancing. And it looked like one of the dancers had some some like sort of socks on, some like you know, beige colored socks. So they were like hidden. Maybe they hadn't needed some protection of some sort. Um, uh, so Manny, other, any other thoughts on the choreography and how it evolved over the course of the show? Yeah, I didn't, I mean, again, I'm not overly, I don't feel like there's anything super original about, you know, hand gesturing in uh, modern chore in modern or postmodern choreography and the move. I mean, it, I'm not saying it wasn't well done. I just don't think there's anything choreographically groundbreaking uh, about American Utopia. It was very, it was very simple. I mean, some of the right. some of the best stuff was them slowly marching in a square. I mean, to, yeah. you know, from a dance standpoint, that's pretty boring. But from you know, in the film, it just worked wonderfully, I thought. I don't know shit about dance, but the what's always impressed me about ballet or any kind of dance, contemporary dance, is synchronicity. And they were tight. That choreography is tight. And even, even when there's a long pause and there you can hear, you can kind of feel them counting it off. And then they all start just like that on the, together, you know, very tight. It was very pleasant. Easy. It was clearly well rehearsed. Um, but again, as I said before, you, you almost sense get a sense that there's this influence of the um, of the drum line from from that uh, uh, documentary he did about the uh, drill teams, and and that choreography in a sense. A lot of that is how how you know bands move in a space and form these patterns and kind of move around, and so much of that is sort of what's going on. And it, it also makes you like amaze yourself that in this very small bit of space, there are these infinite possibilities of how a small group of people can rearrange themselves in different ways that evoke the spirit of some of these films. And I think that's, that's you know, kind of a really fascinating um, thing to do both in the theater, but also on, on, on a film where, you know, it's a very claustrophobic space Yet the film does not at all feel claustrophobic. And and uh, Claire wrote down here that I think she had an ace bandage on her feet, and that's probably so because it did look exactly the color of what an ace bandage might be. Yeah, you you don't want to see the feet of most people who dance for a long time. They're uh, they're yeah. I, or I, most or or many rock musicians, you just don't want to see their feet. Well, that's for different reasons. <laughs> but I did, I did read. I mean, I'm such a fan of of David Byrne as well. That, that they're not dance trained dancers, right? They're musicians. They're they're yeah. brilliant musicians. And apparently, with with the choreographer coming in to work on the staging, really push them. Okay, can they do this while they're still playing and holding their instrument? Right. You know, the weight of it. Okay, yeah. good, that worked. Can they do this? Can we add this? And that they were constantly amazing themselves at how much they could do. So um, the the working with non they're non dancers right for the except most for, part they're not dancers for the, except for the two dedicated well, the yeah. two are really more performance artists apparently apparently they're really more like you know performers and, and and like like being treated like the the court jesters in in a sense both of them like they're they're, they're prescient they're they're mimicking everyone's feelings they're responding to the audience they have a different role. Um, yeah. I mean in a way they're but, cheerleading. Yeah, yeah. But they, you know, they do have a role that where they have a different sense of performance than everybody else. I mean, they're professionals yeah. at it. And and so they do, and they do have a kind of, particularly the guy has the, these court jester faces to him. Right, and he's wearing the makeup that, you know, lets us know he's the court jester. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, Thor, what else do you have to say? Well, I'm, I, I was curious to get uh, other people's opinions on how this fits into sort of a, 
the pantheon of, of rock concert movies because it is, it is, you know, a pop or a rock concert turned into a film. And you mentioned Stop Making Sense, which routinely gets placed at number one or number two in the list of great concert films right alongside uh, The Last Waltz. Um, I would definitely put this right up there um, because it's, you know, it's a single act uh, and it really captures what the evening was like. I mean, to me, it, yeah, there, concert films don't really get much better than this. I agree that uh, they succeed in sort of their goal of removing as many of the obstacles between them and the audience as they can. I think that's the main goal in terms of the look of the film. And uh, I think um, that, that they accomplish it. I think another, I mean, another way to look at this is let's compare it to the last big Broadway performance by a rock star that was turned into a film. Um, and I think it tells us something about the two performers and I'm talking about Springsteen on Broadway um, where he spends more than half of the film actually telling his life story and the songs are almost like punctuation. There, there really is no moment in, uh, and this is not a criticism in American Utopia where we really learn about David Byrne himself. David Byrne is not interested in conveying who David Byrne is uh, in any sort of direct you know, typically autobiographical way. I mean, I, uh, I, I think there's some of that in there. I mean, I think he tells some kind of personal stories. And I, Scotland. <laughs> but yes, we know he's from Scotland and he watched TV as, as when he was young. And um, I mean, there, there are, are some things, but also I think there's, this, is, this is the work of a mature artist as opposed to a young artist. And most music films are younger people on stage doing heroically wonderful things with their bodies and singing and, you know, sort of getting to us. But, you know, like Springsteen and, and David Byrne, they're both mature. They know what they do well and they right. can connect in a very deep way. And looking back and reinterpreting their previous work, but through a mature vision. Right. And, and you know, uh, we've gone 40 minutes in this conversation and we haven't even talked about the, the content, right? He would not have done this play um, if it weren't for uh, the Trump uh, era and the Trump administration, that this is a direct um, response to living in a, what is an American utopia, right? Like if you look at it, he starts the, the, the whole thing off holding the brain up, you know, are we thinking or are we just followers? Are we thinking, do we have a brain? And I think um, I put in the chat some, and I did not know this um, before, um, I guess it's relatively new. David Byrne started a nonprofit over the last uh, six months, which is collaborating with journalists and filmmakers and photographers and writers to uh, find those stories that bring people together. And he, he has one that's called, We Are Not Divided. So that what is, what is the Trump era is about division, division and hatred and polarization. And so this, this is not a concert film. This is, or not strictly a concert film. It is about um, getting people to be kinder and gentler to each other and to talk to each other and to listen and to slow down. Um, and so I put in the I put in the chat. It was um, wonderful to discover this work that he has clearly he has a, a staff and they're raising money. So he's selling drawings that he's done at Pace Gallery to raise money for these um, these journalists to um, to to bring stories out that are about the opposite of division, but about people coming together. So Reason I see the film. <laughs> Yeah, reasons to be cheerful. It's crazy, right? Reasons to be cheerful, and we are not divided. We are not divided is the the title of one of his his website his projects. So and, and you could see that there is a political underpinning through a lot yeah. of of the songs, not sometimes overt and sometimes a lot less overt. But obviously, at the end, it becomes much more poignant, and and I think the end of it is very, um, very powerful. And, and you also mentioned before the, the, the bicycle thing at the end. And I think that's also, you know, I, you know, 
as a major advocate for for bicycling, seeing him bicycle after watching the film, I think is actually kind of a nice thing that can remind people that bicycling is a good thing. Well, he's also the anti-celebrity celebrity, that he's very approachable and he lives in New York City and he walked like out of that was real, that there he was leaving and his fans are waiting outside the performance. And there he's like, yeah, I've got my helmet on and I'm you know, driving away. That looked like a real shot. That looked like a shot when he actually was leaving a performance. Everybody else would be getting into a stretch limo. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I've, I've actually seen him in Austin during South by Southwest on his bicycle riding right down the middle uh, of the street. And, and of course, it, during South by Southwest, it's so crazy, nobody even, you know, pays attention to him. It's like, oh yeah, there's David Byrne riding his bike down the street. So. Mary Ann made a, made a note in the chat of something interesting too, to me as a filmmaker that it, clearly this concert film was at least two performances, if not more, as there are many shots where the camera is on stage. And right yeah, in front of- Yeah, I was going to ask about that. How did they do that? Well, I imagine he's able to perform that show within a half second of in a repeat performance of what he just did. So you can you can shoot the show twice with cameras on stage and, and elsewhere moving around and then intercut it with the live show. Yeah. Certainly that's possible and doable and invisible to the eye. I mean you can just... there are shots in the movie that are not when an audience was present for an actual show. Well, it looked it looked as if uh, there were some shots that it looked as if the cameraman was standing in the second row with the big camera because it was every I just I'm the last person on earth to, to see Hamilton and I noticed uh, the, the film version of that too there were some shots that it was like how did the cameraman get that shot because he, he would have been blocking 200 people's view so maybe maybe like you said it if, if I was going to be shooting this, I would definitely have one time when I could set up for um, and, and do this without an audience, you know, just kind of go in and get the close ups that you need, uh, because, you know, you otherwise can. And again, I'm reminded of uh, Stop Making Sense, where you see the cameraman quite often. Not only do you see the cameraman, but there's one scene where you see the guy holding a light to get the shadows on the back wall. That, that you know it's 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 part of the visual language of, of, of the piece but I, I I don't know that but I suspect that the, that the, that there were shots that were done without an audience I mean I, that's what I would want to do because then you have the real control to get it the way you want it and you get to see the close-ups I think so I have a question uh, that reaches back into Dallas history Thor were you or was anyone else here at the Ban shell at fair when David Byrne did burning down the house in the midst of a lightning storm while the stage was coming apart and being blown around and lightning was flashing in the sky. It wasn't raining, but it was lightning. <laughs> they were doing burning down the house. I will never forget that for the rest. That was before of my time. Was that that was that Talking Heads or was that David Byrne solo? Talking Heads. Oh yeah, that was no before, before. I think that was before I I came to town. But but I was at the Bronco Bowl show, where um, how many of you here in the audience were at the Bronco Bowl Talking Heads show? It, it was like every cool person I knew in Dallas was there. I just you know I thought of like something happening to that event, the city of Dallas coolness level would just. What, what year? What year are you talking about? I think that was eighty three. That uh, that was the uh, the Stop Making Sense tour. Yeah. I think it was 82 or 83. I, I also wanted to ask, since this was before I moved to Dallas, how many of you were living here when he made True Stories, oh. which uh, I watched recently and I didn't think it held up very well. I think it, it, it's uh, the word, you talk about how this new movie is the work of a mature artist. To me, that, that struck me as uh, David Byrne being a little bit too precious and saying, let's go to Texas and make fun of Texas people. <laughs> Brave combo. Yeah, uh, Carl uh, from Brave Combo led the um, led the accordion parade in that, and um, 
Lewis Black from the uh, South by Southwest and the Austin Chronicle um, uh, was uh, performing in the accordion uh, parade in, in that. Um, and he had bad shoes and he'll tell you that story over and over again. <laughs> Um, but uh, yes, and Carl and Brave Combo played at David Byrne's wedding. Yes, that is absolutely true. And I have an interview of him talking about that for this Brave Combo film that one day I will finish. Um, but, uh, you know, True Stories has its issues, um, its narrative issues, really. And it does seem like, you know, somebody coming from New York and kind of poking fun at that. But he also really connected to interesting people in 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 the Dallas and Austin area to 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 be in there. So some of the people in there are, you know, quite fascinating and interesting. And and more than a good film as a film, it's a good film that portrays Dallas at a certain time. I mean, there are certainly people there that are reflective of a kind of way of the city was. Um, I mean, it, it's an further along than reality, but it does sort of suggest some interesting things. And also there are some scenes that were shot in tango, which were really kind of cool. And now that that is long gone, there's that sense of history that still remains. Um, Manny and, and Thor, do you think that this film will have any influence on the way that other uh, musicians will approach uh, making a concert film? I would think yes, because, you know, it, being on a big platform like HBO, um, there's got to be, especially now that we're in an era where where concerts, big concerts have shut down and may be shut down for another year, for all we know, I think there's a lot of musicians out there thinking, what can I do? How can I connect with my um you know, my fans and and there may be people doing shows like this with no audiences to, to do a live concert film. So I, I, I can't, you know, I, I can't say for sure, but I would guess that's gonna have a huge effect on people. Yeah, maybe over the long run, I, I feel like, I mean, I, most people aren't gonna have access to the resources that it took to make this film. Um, so I don't, you know, it's not like, any band can decide and also i mean you don't want to you don't want to copy uh what somebody else has been done what someone else has done i don't yeah i'm wondering whether you know you could really recreate it but i guess it, only time will tell what sort of impact the the film has over the long haul um Somebody said here, but I think the audience in that theater that brings the show to life, the audience in there, you know, does. Yeah, I mean, he refers to them, you see them when he talks about how many of you vote, you know, voting and this and that. And there are times when, you know, yeah, you definitely, and you definitely see um, the audience dancing and, you know, you know. And at the end, the whole cast comes down yeah. Uh, into the and, yeah, into the crowd. Yeah. Although I, Bart, you just you said you just watched Stop Making Sense. I'm trying yeah. to remember the the audience doesn't really play much much of a role in in that film, do they? Except near the end. In the end, there are some audience audience shots, and there are some shots where you can see like over the band over so the audience in in the bottom. And I was just thinking, I bet there's somebody who was in the crowd when they shot Stop Making Sense who was in the crowd here, uh, just because the crowd in this performers were mostly people our age as opposed to younger people. Uh, and so they probably um, were of that age or at least saw that tour and then seeing um, this tour um, because those songs like deeply resonate when you hear them, it like triggers something like sort of deep in your right. consciousness. And they're, and they're so rhythmic. I mean, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, in, in the film and seeing the show at Verizon Theater in Grand Prairie has just struck me that for the most part, people just want to sit. They don't want to dance. And this is some of the most danceable music in the world. And, they're, and people only really want to get up and dance for the three songs that you know are closest to them. But um, so that's, that's, that's one thing that's always kind of driven me crazy about older artists playing at fancy theaters. I remember seeing David Byrne at Bass Hall um, in Fort Worth maybe. 15 years ago and nobody stood up until the last song and dance. So for two hours, you know, basically 
you're sitting there and, and there's this most, you know, this super. So it's not like music. King Sunny Odd Day where you're up the whole time. Right. Oh, right. Well, I mean, you know, if King Sunny Odd Day played at Bass Hall, <laughs> people would be sitting too. People would sit down. Nobody would sit down for, I mean, you can't. It's like impossible. He's the guy where people, audience members actually run up on stage and push dollar bills into the performer's right. body. Like, I, 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 remember, I remember Bart filming that at uh, whatever that <laughs> venue was in uh, in the Cedars 20 years ago. Um, yes, yes, to, to, I, I was there. On what Thor said, um, I, saw, I saw the heads actually two nights in a row in 81, I believe it was, right after the band had expend, expanded from four to, I don't know how many for the road. This is when they, put out uh, Remain in Light, which is the first album that they fully incorporate all of the rhythmic elements. And the show, toward the end of the show, both nights, because it was, you know, uh, you know, it wasn't a spontaneous thing. David Byrne started doing laps around the stage. So he was basically jogging around the edges of the stage. Uh, and this is something he did every night on that tour. He he also did that in Stop Making Sense. There's one point when he's running around the stage. Yeah, <laughs> it was a very surprising uh, moment. In fact, I was so I mean I was what I was 23, and I when I saw it at the I saw it at the University of Miami the first night, hmm. and I and I thought it was amazing. And then I went to see him at an indoor venue the second night, and I was really like disappointed that that was a canned moment and that it wasn't something. That he had just done because you know he was overtaken by what was going on <laughs> I, I i don't think that there are many unplanned moments i think this is a very choreographed um performance and i think in and, and again in looking at stop making sense again last night i, I think everything in there was extremely tightly choreographed right it was i mean you had you, you could tell that the in Stop Making Sense, the uh, female backing vocalists, they have some very elaborate uh, choreography going on. And so, yeah, even though they're, you're free to, uh, what did you say the term is, Manny blocking, where you're, you're free to basically do a certain thing, but, base, but yeah, Byrne knows what's gonna go on. Yeah, and, and, and another thing in looking at these two things that I sort of noticed was, you know, the, the lighting and, and stop making sense is really important. You know, there's, when he comes out in the suit, there's, I mean, the whole thing in the beginning and, and he uses light in really innovative and interesting ways. And in here, there are also moments where lighting is used, stage lighting is used really effectively. And, and I mean, it's really clear that David Burns knows stagecraft mm -hmm. as a performer. He knows how to command, um, that image that he's looking for. But at the same time, he also has this ability to be the sort of soft, but clear leader, right? Like, you know, like he's there, but he's not like, he's in the middle of everything, but everything is sort of connected. You don't think of him as a tyrant, as a leader, but he's sort of like encouraging in a really kind of beautiful way. Yeah, you, you Barthes, about Barthes, there's also that wonderful line where he said, um, I need to change, I need to grow, I need to change, right, as this, as a white man in America at this particular moment in time, which gets back to this being a political piece where he's trying to do his part. Um, I thought that was a very powerful line. Yeah. You mentioned the lighting part. Uh, I think my favorite part in the film was when he's doing the song Blind, uh, which was kind of a, a latter part of the Talking Heads discography. And and the, the, the lighting is from the front. So there's these huge shadows. So each, uh, each band member is appearing as like a 40 foot high shadow in the background. And to me, I just thought that was spectacular. Yeah, I mean, that's, Again, he, he knows how to do that. He knows what to do with shadows in the very sort of uh, Fred Kerchak kind of way. Um, and that was more beautiful in the film than in the play, actually. Very that that much more extended in the in the film version. The the shadow plays, which is a nice point that you just brought up. Indeed, talking about the audience, I love the shot that Spike throws in at the end of that guy after the band has left the house. 
of that guy in the front row kind of staring up into the spotlight, probably very stoned. And he just <laughs> holds that shot for 20, 30 seconds, it seemed like. That was very... You there? You cut out there for a second. Uh, Mark's audio is off for some reason. Oh. Oh, sorry. Did I... So, so I met the guy at the end yeah that spike throws in that shot of the guys just kind of staring up into the spotlight at the end very funny so um last question um for you and everybody else here what is your favorite song in the performance in in in, in the film no, i gotta song? check my song list i knew this was burning funny. down the house yeah I liked, uh, I liked, um, how do you say, is it I Zimbra or I, um, what is it, Manny? Yeah, I mean, uh, the stuff, the early Talking Heads uh, songs where there's more of an African groove to me really clicked because you've got these incredible African rhythms going along, uh, along with these really unusual uh, sort of minimalist choreography. Um, my, my progressive gene kicked in for, um, say their names yeah yeah I, I thought um so i can't give just one answer so i thought um i i was unfamiliar with ray momo i think is how you say it yeah, yeah that's, that's his cuban uh, influenced one man right, right. yeah. That's, yeah that's the one where you use all the latin musicians yeah and I, I i i was not familiar with that song i know sometimes a man is wrong and i thought that was awesome i was also reminded that the old, I guess the oldest song played is the song right after that, which is Don't Worry About the Government from the first album. And that's yeah. the one where he, where he talks about picking a building to live in and it has all the modern conveniences. I also was, I was not, he does three American Utopia songs in a row uh, toward the end. Is it three? Yeah. Um, and I really, I think it was the third one, Every Day is a Miracle. Um, which I thought was another a song I hadn't heard and I thought it was because uh, again I think he I mean he's done some great stuff in the last decade but you know probably his greatest stuff it was earlier and it's it's good to see that he can still come up with a with a really good tune um, at you know at this stage of his career. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's a little sentimental but I liked everybody's coming to my to my house yeah. because of you know, seeing the film during the pandemic and what that, what that. But means. of course, in that song, the narrator's a little worried that they're not going to leave. Yeah. They're or, not going to leave, or, right? They're just stuck with them all. So he says, I, I would love to hear the, uh, the band version that he refers to where, where they're, where they want people to stay. I don't know if anybody has heard that, but um, that's worth looking into. Yeah. That was an interesting reference he made. Well, guys, it's it's 8.30 and I try to be mindful of people's time. That Thank you for spending another hour with us. Manny and Thor, thank you so much for your insights and your thoughts. It's, it's just a real pleasure. I think thank we, you for having me. Yeah, thanks. We should have a little music on the way out here. Thank you all so much. We very much appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a little bit of a choreographer.